No country is isolated or insulated from this menace. So what are they doing to counter it is the question. Let's start with the US. The First Amendment of the American Constitution protects the right to freely exchange ideas, even false or controversial ones. The only legal recourse then against what is deemed fake news is a defamation lawsuit in America. You can sue someone if they publish a false fact about you and you suffered some sort of damage. As a result, such as uh, the loss of a job or a tarnished reputation, you can go to court and say that this is a story that affected you personally. The lawsuit does not just target the person who first published the fake story. It extends to anyone who republishes it on a website or a blog. Remember how First Lady Melania Trump settled defamation lawsuits against a Maryland blogger who published an article in August last year and the online Daily Mail that published a similar false article later that month. Now to France, where President Emmanuel Macron has proposed new rules to crack down on fake news following a surge in uncensored content during the last national elections, which, by the way, the man himself won. So what does this proposal say? It grants emergency powers to judges to remove or block certain content deemed to be fake during sensitive election periods, essentially censorship. It also seeks to curb sponsored content to ensure more transparency. Neighboring Germany, meanwhile, has a law that demands that social media sites remove hate speech, fake news and illegal material. This law mandates that sites that do not remove illegal posts be slapped with a fine of up to 50 million euros. The legislation gives such platforms and networks 24 hours to act after they have been informed about objectionable material. While the obvious focus websites are Facebook, Twitter and YouTube in rules like this, they may also apply or be applied to Reddit, Tumblr, Vimeo and Flickr. Closer home, Malaysia has been the latest entrant to the group of nations that have, ha that have a mechanism in place against fake news and this island nation has a new law now that, that was passed yesterday. This law punishes citizens on social media or those working at a digital publication for spreading fake news. Those guilty are liable to pay a fine of up to 120,000 US dollars and a possible prison sentence of up to six years. The law has been trashed by the opposition there. They're calling it an attempt to muzzle free speech. Finally, Singapore. The country has been working towards enforcing a law to tackle the spread of misinformation. A parliamentary select committee was set up earlier this year to examine whether Singapore needs a law to prevent online falsehoods. An eight-day meeting was held in March, where representatives from social media giants like Facebook and Twitter were asked to appear before this committee to discuss the issue. The idea of a legislation uh, had these tech giants jittery and Facebook representative thought offence was the best form of defence. We'd like you to watch how the Singapore law minister took the Facebook representative to task, asking some very tough questions. Take a look at this. 31. Tech crunch. It says, Stretch, along with counsel from both Twitter and Google, were criticized as being non-committal in some of the answers, including on the issue of banning foreign currency in political ads. Would you accept that as an accurate uh, characterization? I'd actually like to speak to the chair at this point. I'm not certain that this is a fair use of this committee's time. I'm fair to ask me about this. This committee is looking into the issue of deliberate online falsehoods here in Singapore. Uh, myself and my colleague and other people on this panel have come here prepared to answer questions of that and to help the committee understand it. I don't think it's fair to ask me detailed questions about evidence given by my colleague to a different parliament in a different country about activities associated with that country. And I really would like the chairman to consider whether this line of questioning is appropriate. Yeah, okay. You want to say something? I will explain to you why. Obviously, the 15-minute break has helped you decide whether you will or will not answer the questions and the reasons why That's genuinely you not, might not what I'm trying to do. I'm really trying to understand I think we why we are not talking about the issues about Singapore, about deliberate anti alumni fossils here, about what our companies are doing about this, mm -hmm. and instead you wish to discuss evidence given by my colleague to a parliament, to a, a really long, in fact, three long sessions in the US Congress 
to ask me detailed questions about exactly what was said, I do not think that's a, a good use of our time. I respect, uh, really respectfully suggest. Uh, uh, and that is not uh, because I don't want to answer your questions. Uh, I'm Milner, just, uh, uh, if you want to get to something, get to it. Uh, uh, then let's, let's have other people answer some questions. Uh, Mr. Yes. Milner, I think you should leave it to us to decide what is relevant, what is not relevant. But if you're unable to answer questions because you don't know or, re or do not wish to answer the question, please state so. Okay. All right. Thank you. Uh, let me explain to you why this is very relevant, Mr. Milner. I spent most of my career looking at what's relevant and irrelevant. The questions before the UK Parliament were very relevant in exploring the degree to which you can be trusted. Facebook can be trusted to answer questions when asked. Facebook can be trusted to be a reliable partner that a government of Singapore can depend on Facebook to tell us the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in proceedings which, where the witnesses are sworn, or whether you will do everything you can to give lawyers answers or lawyered answers. And, and as I told you earlier, one looks at the sequence of conduct from 20. 15 to 2018 and the very first time you accepted responsibility for Cambridge Analytica publicly, when did that happen and why did that not happen earlier and to what extent can we take seriously all these protestations that you can be completely trusted to apply your internal guidelines. It's very relevant and if you thought that you could turn up here today not answer questions on Cambridge Analytica, and explain your answers today with your answers less than five weeks ago to a different parliament. We are all sovereign parliaments, but we look at your conduct all around the world, and we have to understand. Second, why are we looking at these answers? We are looking at our national security, the consequences we have. By looking at your answers elsewhere, it's clear and you've confirmed, you will not decide on whether something is true or false. You will not take down something simply because it is false. You will take it down if there is a legal obligation on you. And your argument, up to very recently, through the written representations, through the public statements, through all public positions that you have taken, in essence, is that you will prefer to be regulating yourself with your internal guidelines. That's my sense of it. If I'm wrong, I'm wrong. And that you do not want to be regulated. In that context, we are asking you these questions. If you are embarrassed about being confronted with answers that your colleagues have given to other parliaments, you can say so. If you feel unable to support them, of course you can say so. But I think you will leave the relevance of the questions to me and for me to be directed by the chair. Can we move on? I don't need an answer from you.